Hey, Reef Builders, and welcome back to another episode of Reef Therapy. As you can tell, the venue has changed. We are here in the Reef Builders studio once again, which is always fun. It's always nice to kind of, you know, channel what Jake has built. You know what I mean? All of these great tanks, all of this amazing coral, and uh, it's great to be in the Mecca, that's for sure. Uh, today we have Salem. Hello. Hi. Uh, we have Sarah Stevens. Hello. Hello. And a new face, Miss Risa. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm um, we're going to get to know Risa a little bit on this podcast as she's going to be, I know you, you, you're you here at the studio more, you're taking care of some things, but you also have a background in like QTing fish and things like that. So yeah. uh, let's let's dive right in and uh, let's get to know you. Oh boy. <laughs> let's, uh, let's start from the very beginning of like maybe your first aquarium. Oh, um, okay. Uh, well, I was in college. It, well, freshwater, middle school saltwater college and i just got really drawn in by all the complexities of everything in the saltwater world uh because freshwater it's simple the fish mostly run on instinct there's not a lot of ebb and flow <laughs> um but when you get to saltwater everything is so much more complex and that was really really interesting to me as kind of someone who leans into details and obsesses about the whole system it I was hooked. Yeah. 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 And then you went, did you go to college and study all this? No, I actually, uh, I, I have an art degree. It's in graphic design. Um, nice. Yeah. Mass communications. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I always have loved marine science and I guess I was just enough of a nerd about it all that here I am. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And then what's your professional experience on the aquarium side of things? Um, so I actually started at a little local fish store in Daytona Beach, Florida, called uh, The Fish Tank, and got an, just a more interesting view of what it looks like on a grand scape of things. And then from there, I worked at retail stores in Florida, all the way up to Top Shop Aquatics. And then uh, I also have experience in wholesale and public aquariums, and right now I work here and uh with chris cap at aquatic art and it's a lot of fun yeah yeah top shelf is pretty sweet right yeah <laughs> far, I, I i can imagine you know being on the farm every day is probably a really cool thing yeah it was surreal it was very hard for me to focus because it's so cool salem will you go push the birds into jack's room yeah i'm gonna push the birds into jack's room. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your public aquarium experience okay so um the good and the bad <laughs> okay. Um, I one of the make, biggest things I learned working at uh, Sequest, the local public aquarium, uh, was the difference between public aquaria and the hobbyist industry is way greater than I thought it would be. Um, hobbyists care so much about every single little creature in their tanks. They will set up an entire quarantine system just because one of their fish is sick. And not that public aquaria staff don't care. But it's about the system as a whole. And there's, you know, there's a lot less of that hobbyist obsession with like, oh, this is my friend Nacho. Like, there's a lot less of that. And it's more just about the beauty of the system as a whole. Sure. Um, and that was really, really interesting to see. And also, on top of that, those systems are huge. Uh, one of ours was 37,000 gallons. And the upkeep on those is insane. Yeah. It makes any hobbyist tank look so easy. Sarah, can you chime in on any of the public aquarium? Do you think that those, those like the hobbyists taking more care of the aquarium or um, more specific care, I guess you could say? I think it's it depends on kind of the lens. Uh, when you're looking mm -hmm. at animal well-being as a whole, um, as a public aquarium or, or a zoo, you are looking at individual animals, but to your point, there is the larger system that sometimes has to be managed. So if you have a school of 2,000 fish, uh, if you have like a bait ball or something, it's almost impossible to identify individually if every single one is okay. So you're really more managing the health of the group. Um, but I would still say that there's a, a ton of work that does go into individual welfare and well-being um, at AZA-accredited zoos and aquariums, specifically around enrichment and training and welfare assessment. I think that's yeah. something that as a hobby we 
maybe do very like passively where we go, oh, I know that my animal is, is, looks different or something's wrong. But when you're looking at it at a public aquarium level, it's actual scores. So you can really take that subjective, something doesn't feel right and really make it objective. And that's something I'd love to see the hobby pick up on. Yeah. But I do agree there is definitely more of when they are yours, it is different how you view them when you're managing animals at your job. Yeah. And I think it is a really just different level of connection because you have to be slightly disconnected when you're working at that scale. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, it'll crush you. Yeah. That is a really good point. Uh, the, the responsibility that comes behind taking care of all of those animals comes with its own emotional yeah. complex. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's expand on that score. I think that's really cool. Um, how can we rate our fish and corals in our own tanks? I mean, what are some of the what are some of the questions that you would ask? And yeah, what are those? What are those? Like, how would we rate our fish if we were to look at them? So usually, when we're looking at an animal where we're going to be doing a welfare assessment, we are looking at five different kind of domains. So these are the areas of. Uh, the five freedoms where these animals should be doing well if they have good welfare. So one of those is food and nutrition. Are they being offered appropriate food and nutrition for that species? Another example is environment. Is that animal in the appropriate environment for it to do well? Is it getting the natural cues it needs? Things like that. Then you've got physical needs. So is this animal able to have the space it needs to be successful uh, is it in a space where it's not getting beaten up by other individuals? So body score wise, like does it have nipped fins or is it getting scraped on things? And then we're looking at mental state. So is this animal displaying stereotypic behaviors or things that we're concerned about because it's kind of bored uh, or not being pushed enough? And then um, behavior, is it displaying species specific behaviors? Mm. And what you can do with mental state and behaviors, that's where things like enrichment and training really come in because that's how you're stimulating your animals. Now, if you have a really engaging environment with a lot of complexity, you have individual animals, all of the, or you have multiple animals, every social interaction between those animals is a type of enrichment. It encourages them to have to think, to work, to kind of adapt in their space. Um, but yeah, you go through and you have inputs and outputs. So things that are acted upon the animal and things, the animals display, and we go through and we have a rubric of what does a one look like? So for instance, if we have a tang and we're not giving it seaweed, it would probably get a one, which would be a a poor for us. We look at poor, fair, and good. Um, and then if they were getting algae sometimes, but it's not always available, and we're supplementing with some other foods, maybe it's a two. If it always has the ability to graze, things like that, that'd be a three. And you can go through and you can score your animals, and it can change. You can have other people score them, because sometimes we're like, oh, but I think it's doing well because I want it to do well. So we'll have (laughs) different keepers score things. And what you can do is you can look and you have actual numbers, and you're like, okay, last year this animal was a three, We've got perfect scores. Now we're at a 2.8. What's changed? And you can start looking long term. What is actually going on with your animals? That's okay. actually really cool. Yeah. Um, so I could go down and rate the fish, and then I could pay my wife to go down and look at the fish and see if <laughs> totally. our scores are the same. Not <laughs> Just go look, watch for like an hour and, and give you some notes. I know yeah. that people, because last time we did a podcast in front of the peninsula, the water box here, People had commented on the gem tang, Mm -hmm. and I think this was a, I'm pretty sure this was a gem tang that Jake had actually rescued, Mm -hmm. and it was pretty beat up when it came in. And those, those dorsal fins have never really regrown, regrown back. So with that, with that gem tang, who looks totally fine grazing right now as we speak, um, would that get a lower score just because those fins are not present? It could. The nice thing about scoring the animals too is you have historic information so you could go in and you could say okay we know this animal's a rescue and while this is not necessarily a three when compared to a wild like perfect specimen we know that as this animal came to us um, it's still improving or we know that these fins will never regrow Uh, so you can continually either choose to score it poorly 
and you should never get a perfect honestly like you really should never get a three there should be something you can improve upon i think that's something we should always strive for in any part of the reefing hobby Mm -hmm. you will never have a perfect tank you will never perfectly care for your animals there's always something a little bit different you could do better and that goes for our animals too there's always something we could do a little bit better so for me actually a three is like a red flag if something like an animal it gets full perfect scores yeah either that person maybe doesn't know enough to look at a more nuanced view of the animal or um they are maybe not being truthful um with themselves about the state of that animal because there's always areas where we can push a little harder gotcha so in terms of like az zoos this seems like it's an existing model for fish or like you know like dolphins sufficiently advanced animals do they have like a similar or like changed rubric for like invertebrates like do coral get evaluated because like yeah the mental state of a coral is <laughs> you know so how do you know yeah. yeah or like jellies that don't have brains yeah uh yeah so when you're looking at those animals you can remove that section of the scoring you can still look at the physical health of the animal is it reacting to... So for our corals, when we um, score them, I poke them. And I go, do you react to that poke? Or like, do, does the coral retract? Because it should retract when it's kind of harassed. So if it's not retracting, is that a sign that something is going wrong? Something's not firing correctly? So yes, when it comes to invertebrates, it does get a little bit trickier because they don't love to tell you how they're feeling until they're dead. They're like... <laughs> I am perfect. Oh, no, I died. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't catch the tiny minutia? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm gone forever. <laughs> so, you know, we had to get very creative. And early on when we were really working on establishing our welfare protocols, because this is a part of our AZA accreditation for every single animal, we have to do this. There was a ton of conversation of how do you tell when a sea star is happy? <laughs> like, is that coral in distress? And there's obvious signs, but, um, you know, you, you tweak it to the individual animal. So there's kind of a set template or rubric that you can use, but every zoo has slightly different ones. I know that um, San Diego Zoo, uh, San Diego Global has some animal welfare trainings, the aquarium vet. Uh, which is the Equarist training model modules. They also have an animal welfare assessment like uh, seminar. It's like an hour or two that's free. That's a resource. Um, and Disney actually has wonderful enrichment and animal welfare literature and things like that that you can read through, as well as the AZA website. So if people are interested in doing this for their animals, there are resources out there that they can okay. start building these. And it makes it a lot easier to objectively say no something is wrong yeah. or really try and pinpoint oh like a year ago i changed this one thing and there's a decline maybe it is that one thing that i changed yeah mm. that's that's interesting too because i feel like with how the hobby is going we're so data driven these days mm-hmm. and you know after you know meeting salem the the argument is okay you're making this claim about fish coral parameters or whatever show me the data mm-hmm. because so much of this hobby is anecdotal and and just passed down from you know the do i put a sarco in, in a tank with acro that you know those are toxins that are passed from the sarco to the acros that's something that's passed down i never do that because but do we actually know where's the data i'm sure there there's a paper out there somewhere but you know those like i don't want to say old wives tales but mm-hmm. like those things that are just passed on you know, a beginner gets it and they're like, no, a Zoa needs a dirty tank. Yeah. What does that mean? Where's the data? <laughs> so it's good that you have a track record of your animals in your tank mm-hmm. and how they go over time. So I think maybe there's there's a, you know, we take the AZA, we take, you know, San Diego, San Diego Zoo or whatever. Is that what you said? Yeah, it's just a resource that the, is yeah. accessible. But take those and make them hobby friendly. Like yeah. how do we, you know, rate our, our corals and fish in our, our aquariums? the reef builders rubric yeah (laughs) yeah absolutely and it's not it's something that kind of for me is a great introduction to starting to take a slightly more critical eye to your animal care and your husbandry because it's something that maybe sounds kind of complex but really when you break it down it's in a perfect world what would this animal look like and in its worst possible state, what would it look like? And then figuring out where's the middle. 
And once you've kind of got those two endpoints, and you can even look, if you really like somebody's tank online and you're like, this is what their coral looks like and I want my coral to look like that, maybe that's your, your three, that's your, your great. Um, and other institutions, you, you could add more numbers, you know, just because we use three points doesn't mean you couldn't use 10 and figure out what is all of the points in between that gets it even more dialed in. Yeah. I think you're kind of like the most obvious are doing this anyway. Yeah. But just not taking notes, you know? Yeah. And that's a lot of what it is. It's just another type of track record. And when you are tracking what you're doing in a way that you can go back and look, it gives you just so much more ammo to work with when you are troubleshooting or triaging. Yeah. Mm. Going back to uh, QTing and observation, you were talking about looking at the fish for the first couple of weeks that you have it in a QT tank. Um, let's we, we did a video about this today, and it, it'll come out eventually, but setting up a basic QT tank is what we went through. And I think so much of this hobby is observation. So why should we start with a QT tank and just look instead of instantly going straight to copper or you know whatever prophylactically? Right. Um, so a lot of the hobby is observation and that's surely one of the most important parts of it. Initially, when I get a fish, I am thinking I want to protect my display. I want to protect all of the animals that I love and I have already from whatever this fish may be carrying. So if the fish comes from the ocean, if it comes from a wholesaler, if it comes from another tank, you can never be sure that there's not something else that's coming with it. Um, and a lot of medications, although they are certainly effective, will at first reduce symptoms and have the, have the fish suppress those symptoms. And that's why observation is so important without medications, because if you're going to catch that thing, you're going to catch that parasite before it gets into your display, it's really important to see the fish's context without meds that make it suppress whatever symptom it may be showing. Yeah. So we were talking about this with local fish stores and a lot of local fish stores just have copper in their fish systems already. Mm -hmm. So would you rather have a fish that has been through a copper treatment like that prophylactically at the local fish store? Would you rather have it untreated so that you can do all of that yourself? Um, I am not sure that it matters whether they've been through it or not. What matters to me is that I take that fish home and I'm not going to continue putting them through that. So I'm going to give them a number of weeks in a quarantine tank with no medication, just an observational tank and give their immune system time to express any symptoms that a copper treatment at a store may have suppressed so that I can catch whatever that might be. And then down the road, if I do catch it, I can treat it. Gotcha. From a like zoo commercial, I know you guys both have experience there, obviously, mm -hmm. When they get to you, have they been through any kind of treatment? Um, some wholesalers do offer quarantine services. Usually, uh, though, it's pretty limited, and it's really dependent on space. Um, we had an incident, not incident recently, but we had a, a we were talking with a wholesaler to potentially quarantine some fish for us just because we didn't have a large enough holding at the time to... We didn't have space in the back to do the quarantine and they just didn't have the space. So they were unable to. So we had to kind of figure out a different solution. Um, so it's also, there's a lot of trust involved with QTing with somebody who's not you. Uh, you can absolutely like have faith in that supplier and things like that. But I feel like if anybody's like me, like if I break it, I'm a lot less mad than if I trusted somebody else and then they break it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just in life in general. <laughs> so like if I, you know, paid money or had somebody quarantine something and then it came to me and it something got missed, I for whatever reason, that's gonna be more annoying than if I'm met just mad at myself about yeah. like, missing that thing. So I think trusting yourself is really important when it comes to quarantining. I definitely worked at a place that did copper in systems and i i feel like honestly like the levels you can keep the copper at long term mm -hmm. really might knock back things like ick but we were we were just talking about um back in like the 20 knots like 2011 when those uh monobidinium flatworms were ripping through 
wholesalers and fish stores alike, and you had to basically do freshwater dips for prazi. Yep. Um, to knock them back. Yeah. And even then, they had their life cycle was just enough that once they were pretty much in your system, unless you ran that system fallow for like three weeks, you were probably going to still have them. Uh, so that copper did nothing. And I think it sometimes gave a false sense of security to people who were taking those fish home. So even though you were like, definitely quarantine it, like, I'm telling you, please quarantine these fish. It still, I think, gives a false sense of security. Yeah. Yeah. And I've also seen in a lot of cases, if copper is used for a long period of time, it, A, can damage, I mean, fish can only take so much copper for so long. It's essentially like chemotherapy. It kills the parasite just faster than it kills the fish. Yep. Uh, so there can definitely be detrimental long-term effects of that. And eventually, in an industry that is using copper on everything, you get copper-resistant strains. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, there is downfalls to every consistent thing that the industry does with quarantine. And it's a tricky thing because there's no one-size-fits-all. I was just thinking about how, and that was perfect, saying it's kind of like chemo. I think a lot of times when we talk about medication and some of these treatments in the context of our animals, we're thinking of it of like giving them Tylenol. But a lot of mm -hmm. times we're giving them something much stronger, medications that you're like hospitalized with and yeah. they're knocking you on your right. butt. Like, so being aware that just because it, the fish isn't telling you that they have vertigo or things or, you know, those like really intense symptoms doesn't mean that the medications we're giving aren't also detrimental. Yeah. Just more slowly. Yeah. And That's there's, point. there's so much nuance to all of that. It's just, yeah. Like you said, it's important to keep in mind that no medication is actually good for your fish. It is better for your fish than allowing that parasite to keep eating away at them, but it's not a vitamin. Yes, absolutely. Salem, is there copper-resistant bacteria? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nitrifiers can become resistant. So you can have, like, a, like you know, stores where you have fish-only systems that constantly run copper. You can have the cycle yeah. remain intact. as a nuke everything. But I have a, a devil's advocate-esque series of questions, because I don't know. I'm ignorant about this. Serious. <laughs> um, okay, so, like, let's say, like, at least when I worked at different shops— we would transship the fish from Endo, mm -hmm. or we would get fish from a wholesaler. At that point, you know, it's a mystery. They've not expressed symptoms. We're, like, sometimes they're like, oh, my God, they've got uranium already. Like, this is crazy. Like, yeah, <laughs> what do we do with, with this? Melted, yeah. yeah, but if you've got that kind of mystery question, obviously, whenever fish or any animal goes through a stress event, that is when that virulent state is likely to show its head. Would, like, from an ethical perspective, would having a system that already has copper in it or an existing medication, like maybe it's got a sufficient dose of metro in the system and you're continually dosing it, I think, I guess from a, like a logistics perspective, would those fish not have a higher likelihood of surviving because you would be beating back whatever could be expressed from the stress of transit at that time? That's a really good question, and I think the answer is nuanced. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, in my experience, a lot of what you're actually battling there, like, yes, the fish comes in, it has a parasite, it has a disease, whatever it is. You're also battling stress. And as that fish regains its health and its immunity and the stress level goes down, most importantly, it's able to do some of that fighting on its own. Um, but you have to be careful because those medications can compounded with stress they can have effects on the fish long term so def i understand the long-term angle for sure but in my mind if you have fish that is a carrier for xyz and they have just gone through that stress event if you put them in a system without medication versus one that they do have medication mm -hmm. and the one with medication if that whatever they are carrying becomes expressed it is dealt with to some extent so they're going through the stress event but without the added stress like biotic stress of that disease state Versus you have a fish that goes through both at the same time. Mm. I mean, would that not be a, like prophylactically treated in that way? Would that not be a necessary cost to ensure more fish survive transit? I think it's definitely, it's nuanced. No. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> That's going to be our new t-shirt. 
because uh, it really is. You know, if, if I open a <laughs> if I open a box and all of those fish are showing so much stress that they're like on the bottom on their sides, gills are flaring. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to throw an additional chemical that's going to take multiple days to start being affected because I, I think that's. Really, the crux of it is no medication starts working the moment it's in the system. It True. takes a while for it to build up. So you're adding a stressor that's not really going to be effective until a couple, like at least 24 hours later, if you're lucky. Some of them really take a little bit longer than that. So in that first 24 hours, looking at the animal that came in, you kind of have to make a decision of, Will giving this animal 24 hours to calm down, de-stress a little bit, get settled, help it have the energy to get through the medication and the disease? Or is the, getting the 24-hour jump on this disease more important? And I think most of the time, it's going to probably be give that animal, like slow down to catch up or to speed up, basically. So you slow down, take a minute, let the animal get somewhat assimilated. Because any animal that's going to, die from that disease is most likely going to also die from the treatment Mm -hmm. in the first 24 hours i think what you're really looking at is how does it impact it at the 72 hour mark at the week mark that's really more when medicating is going to have an impact on those animals that first 24 hours is really stress okay so that makes sense to me that maybe sometimes there can be too much stress to where you know you just lose the fish if, if let's say you've got a fish that maybe it's like 75% of the way there, like three quarters chance it might die. What are practical ways that that stress could be reduced? Is there really nothing that we can do but time or are there methods that could be deployed there? Usually a dark tank. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Um, I always try when I get a fish in that's really, really stressed. First of all, avoid medication. Um, because even if the fish doesn't consciously know, its body knows, its organs are filtering that out, all of that. And I always try to... This fish comes in in critical condition. I'm going to try to emulate the ocean environment that I know it's from. If it's a deep water fish, I'm going to give it a dark tank. I'm going to give it caves. I'm going to give it upward flow. I'm going to try to emulate the environment where it had zero stress. Because the lower the cortisol is in their blood, um, the more their immunity can spike up. And they may even start to fight that disease on their own before you start medicating. But if you medicate too early... They can be dealing with too much stress, and their body can't deal with the parasite and the medication. It's almost like they fight each other on that. So, like, let's say we, this is like a course of time. So some fish die, some fish are really stressed. Let's say you make it past the 24-hour mark. At what time do you begin trying to acclimate kind of like the feeding response? When do you try to initiate them to get eating? Do you just kind of throw some, something in there, like live food or something, to see if they have something, or... Where does that start? Um, I'll defer to you because you're more on the fish side okay. than I am. Um, I would say that it depends case to case. If that fish is a difficult eater, I like to start with things that are really easy for them to eat, things that they may even see in nature. Uh, using live food can really help even brine shrimp. Even though they're not super nutritious, it can help tide the fish over to where it's willing to try some new foods. And you can gut load them too. I think that's the nice thing about live food is you can gut load it. And it may take time. I mean, for let's say a copper band butterfly, it it may take time. It may take weeks for it to get used to eating what you're going to feed in the display. Um, And I think it's just important for you as the quarantine specialist uh, (laughs) to understand the difficult process that that fish is facing and to try to emulate nature and slowly work your way up to what you'd be feeding in the display. A lot of copper bins don't make it in displays, and there's numerous reasons for that, but a lot of it comes down to feeding. They're used to going and hunting and picking off little live things, and you throw a big dose of mysis shrimp in there a couple times a day, it's not going to know what that is, and it's certainly not going to be willing to compete for it in the mealtime. Um, so getting that fish to where, A, it is calm, de-stressed enough to try some new foods, and then B, recognizes that and goes after it, despite the fact that there's other fish going after it as well. It's all about a slow incline to where your display kind of sits in terms of routine. 
That's a really good point, too. When you have a fish isolated, it doesn't have to compete. There's no chance of it being bullied, which will increase stress. You can give it foods that other fish might be more aggressive eaters um, and give that animal time to get used to how you feed or you're getting used to how you need to feed that animal. Um, and you don't have to worry about that competition element. It just adds a whole level of complexity when you're trying to manage a brand new animal, that animal's behavior, that animal's body state in the mix of your little tiny city which has a whole cast of different characters who are also acting upon that animal. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Here's a silly question, as I do. <laughs> can we, am I putting multiple fish in the same QT? You can. Yeah. So would they have to be, would they have to be purchased and brought in at the same time? Or is this something that, like, if I went and bought a yellow tang and I've got it in QT, Two weeks later, I get a tile fish. I put him in there, you know, that kind of thing. So for us, for me personally, new animal restarts quarantine clock. Agreed. Uh, Agreed. Yeah. Because each time you introduce a new animal, in theory, you're introducing new parasites. And you have to, like, let's say you're going to do a four-week copper treatment, but you bring in another fish two weeks into it. Those new parasites could spread to the old fish. And so even though the four weeks will have lapsed, that fish is not ready. Um, and I think there's also a big element of compatibility with that. When I look at quarantining multiple fish together, really what I'm asking is, will it help them de-stress to be together? Or is it going to elevate their stress level to be together? So yeah. a yeah. school of fish, great. Quarantine them together because they'll be way more stressed if they're alone. But anything that doesn't have that natural biological calming response when they're together, probably not worth doing because it's going to make that de-stressing period worse. So purple tangs. Purple tang, yellow tang, don't do it. Tan together, do it, Tan together. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck, buddy. Um, I'm interested to know if there's anything that maybe we haven't talked about from a commercial or from the zoo side of things, from the public aquarium side of things, that we could bring into our hobby from a QT standpoint, you had mentioned something earlier that I thought was pretty fascinating Yeah, um, um, on how to identify some things that might be going on with the fish. Yeah. So this is something that I have only done a handful of times, but I read about it and was immediately obsessed. Um, there is something, I don't know if you've ever done a floor sign dip. No, we were talking about yeah. it a little bit earlier and I was really fascinated. Yeah. Okay. So essentially floor sign is a fluorescent pigment. It's not a medication. It's not going to affect parasites or anything in any way. Um, but by creating a bath of salt water with this fluorescent pigment and leaving a fish in there for, I don't know, like a half an hour and 45 minutes, enough for that pigment to become immersed in their body. And then doing a second bath of regular salt water, something kind of magic happens. Um, you put a UV light over these fish. They're in the salt water after they left that bath. Yeah. And simply because the pigment is in their body and the mucus lining of a fish is their seal. So it keeps all the inside on the inside and all the outside on the outside. If there is any even tiny break in their, in their mucus coating, whether it's from bullying, whether they scraped on a rock, whether it's a parasite, no matter what that is, after sitting in that bath and soaking in that pigment, and then being exposed to UV light in fresh water, well, new salt water, um, you can actually see every single little impurity in that slime coat. That's cool. Because the pigment is in their body, and as it leaches out through whatever little pinholes there are, you can see it. It glows. And so it's so cool to see a fish that you think is doing great. And, you know, maybe it is. It's acting great. It's eating great. And you do this dip and you see that, oh, actually, they've got some parasites. They have a, you know, an abrasion on their fin. They have all of this. And it makes it so easy to kind of analyze the health of that fish just in terms of body condition because it literally glows at you. That's cool. It and then you so can cool. score them based on that. Yeah, like how much you glow? How much you glow? <laughs> should it And then glow? you can actually <laughs> retrieve all of your fish from your display tank before a party, put them back Ooh. into your tank. They all fluoresce. But your racing friends <laughs> judge you. Yeah. New glowfish. I was no. going to say, so much easier to just go buy glowfish. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
they've got angel fish now. No, it's we've crazy. Got to overcomplicate it. <laughs> I think just that's way. that's super interesting though, because like you were just mentioning to Remy about you know resetting the clock, like. How do we know the four weeks is up? Well, how do we know it's four weeks, right? I mean, right. as you all said, it's very nuanced. It is nuanced. And what if that strain is resistant to copper? Then yeah. Is it six weeks? But I mean, what if your tank is warmer and it speeds up Ooh. the life cycle of the parasite Thank you. and you get through quicker? This could provide a check, though. You would have a way yeah. to verify if quarantine has worked at four weeks, six weeks, whatever, to determine your qualitative means. Like, that's, I think that's kind of what we talked about here is observation. Yeah. But how to make observation better. Right. Scoring and using something external to actually tell right. you. And I think the hobby is really missing that because it's a crapshoot. Even like the best, like humble fish, you know, certified quarantine people, they still could not truly verify or check their right. work. It's their best guess, guess based off of experiential knowledge. And they do a really good job. But Absolutely. how do we know that sometimes things don't slip through the cracks? Well, and even... Even if you observe perfectly, even if you're somehow able to watch that fish and stare at it for 24 hours a day for four weeks, mm -hmm. there are steps that we all miss. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, you miss uh, piping. You, you miss one little scratch. You miss whatever it is. But the science of that leaves it so that you really, even if you do miss that, it shows up later. And it's so cool because that actually is a verified way to check parasites, scrapes, abrasions, whatever it is, any flaw in that fish's ability to protect itself from the environment is very obvious. Gotcha. I'm wondering why this hasn't been more used. I think it's probably because uh, a lot of us kind of, well, a lot of us here at this table, we all do this kind of for a living, right? But you, when you're talking to the average hobbyist who isn't always around their tank, isn't always observing, right. just kind of recreationally has a tank in their living room. Maybe even somebody else maintains it, you know, uh, more passively. Maybe that's just why it's not more readily available. Or maybe it's just on a commercial scale or available yeah. to the commercial. Yeah. When I first read about all of this, I was reading out of a pharmacology textbook that is used in growing fish for food. So the commercial aquaculture, these fish are going to be food. And there's a lot of science I have learned that is used in that field that just hasn't quite translated over to ours. Gotcha. Tilapia. How, yeah. <laughs> how expensive was the fluorescein? It's actually pretty affordable. Um, you can find it at a lot of agricultural stores. Okay. Uh, I believe that it's also used in some sort of farming, some sort of something like that where it's helpful to see a water flow. Mm, yeah. um, where it's helpful for you to be able to see very easily where water is going and where it's not. Um, but it turns out it has a really great application. Yeah. Oh, I love stuff like that. I yeah. love when something's made for something <laughs> else. <laughs> and it's perfect. <laughs> I think I've seen uh, people use, like, it may have been something different than the fluorescein, but it was a green fluorescent pigment to show how sponges pull water in and filter it. Exactly. It's so, sort of, uh, what do they call it when they, um, they put that radioactive ink into your body no. and they watch where it goes like all i can th all i can think about is the, the dying of the chicago river oh. oh when they do this for st patrick's day but i think that's that's the same kind of like it's the use case for that is to see where streams go or sure. you know the path of whatever yeah. they you know dump it in one side and they go down the stream they see how far it makes it or whatever sure. they just use that in mass for the chicago river during the st patrick's day celebration i wonder if that's the same substance or maybe it's not that's interesting it's in i think it's in powder form it comes in powder form it's like a it red is, powder uh i don't the powder actually is red, but it glows kind of green yellow. Yeah, we yeah. need Joe Rogan's Googler on this podcast. <laughs> Thank you. So. <laughs> yeah. Some yeah, to the that's side. interesting. That's really interesting. Well, and if you if you look at fluorescent pigments, so blowfish were initially designed as a way to test stress responsive fish in streams. So the idea was that that fluorescent pigment would turn on when the fish were stressed, and that didn't quite pan out. And then they were just like, oh, we've got this really cool glowing fish. This And 10-year-olds love them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to trademark that. So my son is so I attracted to these things. Whenever, whenever we're going to Petco to get crickets for our leopard gecko, I'm like, dude, there's so many other cool, interesting things in this store. Not really, but like from a fish perspective. I mean, it is pretty cool that a lot of it's like jelly fluorescent pigments that have been injected into a fish. And now Fine. that fish... 
produces that. It's transgenic Fine. fish. That's pretty cool, man. I mean, that's kind of a man. I know I just, it's a zebra Daniel, but still man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they've got angelfish now. Oh, they've got tiger barbs yeah. now. They've got betas they now. they got long yeah. fin tiger barbs. I actually saw the yeah. other day. I don't know if it's the same blowfish effect, but they have axolotls now. Well, I think I've seen yeah, that right. too. Yeah. I don't just, know if that's the same are process. Are there any but... saltwater fish yet? They Not go on yet. their own. You can't, keep, you can't talk about that. Oh, sorry. That's <laughs> an R&D. They don't know about yeah. that. Salem, Salem's currently working on that. Oh, it, just, it just makes me feel like I... Has I'm... anybody tried glowing coral? Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wait a second. There is a lot of oh that God. already. Wow, well, that might work. It's natural, yeah, it's organic. It just, just makes me think of a bowling really alley. And people believe it. Like, uh, <laughs> it makes me think of a bowling alley, like night bowling at a bowling alley. That's what those glowfish mm-hmm. remind me of. Yeah. Like, that's or, uh, where they mini belong. Golf. Mini golf, yeah. 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 Got, some, got some vibes. I'm yeah. thinking about the application of dyes now, just like writ large. So, like, you mentioned, like, the flow yeah. thing. Like, I don't like you know screw a flow meter just put like a put a little well, fluorescein in the tank see well, where things um, go. People who do that for when they're testing flow in their tanks they'll they'll use either a dye or, or I mean because you could probably pull those out relatively easily with carbon. Yeah, yes. carbon. Yeah, um, have it's the you Red Sea product, AB plus. Yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> fluorescent um, yellow. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Have you guys ever seen at um, an expo, a coral show, Aquashell, Reef of Palooza, whatever it is? Uh, a lot of the companies that make wave makers will. Set up a tank and they'll fill it with these tiny little, like neon yellow, neon pink mm. spheres. Oh, the orbies, yeah. yeah. The oh, yeah. <laughs> and they Gene Wilson exactly is listening to this. He's like, doing. yeah. He's like, thank you for that. They're yeah, the little, uh, the what are they? What are they made of? They gotta be plastic. Or the something. orbies, like a, yeah. Like but what are they? Neutral buoyancy. I don't know. Gel That's thing. Not what they take on water and they grow. Yeah. Well, those are orbies, but I think if those were actually orbies, they'd fill the tank and it would not work. Uh, but it's something like <laughs> not if, if there was a dye that was safe for your animals, safe for coral, right. if you were moving around your pumps and you could just like check with dye, this like a safe dye, that's what, I'm what your flow is doing, that's when you find, oh no, that uh, sarcophyton is putting that's all the slime coat onto my acro. Ah, <laughs> dye the mucus? That's why it's dead. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to swap them. It'll be fine. Like I, <laughs> I use dye uh, for cultures, like, right? Yeah. So, sure. like, it's just a great qualitative tool that I don't think is explored. Like, tripan blue, you can look under a microscope. If I order phytoplankton, I can dye it and look, and any cells that turn blue are dead. So, I'm like, dude. You sent me dead uh, Fido, and they're like, "What?" And I'm like, "Look, <laughs> but like, I'm like the same thing." You sent thing. dead Fido to the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think Detective. these are things that like no one's talked about that could really differentiate like yeah. unknowns for people. I don't know. Yeah, and I'm not sure how much a hobbyist would use that versus someone who has a huge tank and needs no dead spots because it's all SPS. I think there's probably applications either way, but it's a really cool concept to throw around. Well, I also think, too, we're undervaluing the fun factor. Like, just because <laughs> I maybe, you know, a hobbyist doesn't have a 2,000-gallon SPS tank doesn't mean that somebody wouldn't find joy in their 20-gallon. Like, true. look at where the flow goes. <laughs> <laughs> like, <make a> spiral. <laughs> so I think, too, like, there's a lot of things that, that don't seem like they have an application, but I mean, we're all in this hobby because we love to tinker and we love to learn and we love to play with stuff. And I think that that's just an additional way to play (laughs) with your tank. Yeah. I think if we're to title this, it would be something along the lines of observational, whatever. Uh, I'll use that in the title. Um, (laughs) But what are some other interesting things that you've noticed or observed about the behavior of maybe inverts or fish? I think right off the bat for me i can think of and this probably happens a lot with most people it's the most apparent would be if there's if you've got a spawning pair of any kind of fish and it's very apparent that something is happening there when i see my, the female clownfish in my tank out but i don't see the male i know that he's fanning the eggs right he's 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 keeping over what keeping watch over the over the clutch um but what are some other interesting like things that you guys have observed in tanks just by looking at it, I mean, if you look at like a just a little section of you know the, the milk of stylo here, you just look at it and just observe what are the different creatures that are coming around it. What what are creatures that are using it for shelter? You know, things like that. Anything come to mind off the off the bat? Um, Stomatella snails coming so, out and being unsung heroes. Um, they're my favorite off the top of my head earlier you had said something about 
uh, the, you know, the coral health scale and how sometimes you can tell behaviorally that something is wrong with that coral and you're not sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I have been noticing lately in working with a lot of corals that sometimes corals that have pests on them react differently to that interaction. So, uh, for example, a lot of times I've noticed that zoas that are infected with zoa eating nudibranchs, uh, they, for whatever reason, you can use your turkey baster and try to, you know, make them flinch up. And if they have a pretty bad infestation, they won't. They'll stay open. They'll resist it. It's, and yeah, I was going to say it's probably because they're being pestered and harassed all the time. So now stimuli doesn't mean something's trying to, well, something is trying to eat me, but <laughs> right. in a different way, like, like a higher threshold. Yeah. They, they have like a higher tolerance for being harassed. That's interesting. I kind of attributed it to, uh, I know that I'm in bad shape because something is actively eating me. I need photosynthesis so bad that it's not worth it to close. I'm not going to yeah. use the energy to close and then open again. I'm just going to resist there's probably some sort of stealth mode that those guys throw on too i would imagine oh, sure. right sure. i mean they're already camouflaging themselves what a cool freaking invert right those things are so cool you pull them off and they're oh. fluorescing whatever color the zoa is i hate that they're like so bad for your tank it does suck so beautiful yes oh, <laughs> everyone's like i want nudibranchs well you just have to feed them some yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can have whatever color you want. Of nudibranchs. <laughs> Whoa, nudibranchs. Yeah. Ah, oh, I know. Some pests are truly underappreciated, and just because they cause chaos in our home tanks does not mean they're not beautiful. Yeah. Do you guys, can you guys think of anything? I know this is like a super pointed question, but I feel like if anything, I'd like to offer up to hobbyists listening to just look at like one little section of your tank and just observe it for 20 minutes. I feel like I'm, I need to take a moment to like think about this because I'm so in my tank all the time, but I'm doing maintenance or I'm scraping glass sure. or I'm doing something to care for the tank and not actually taking time to observe the amazing creatures that we care for. You know, I like to keep an eye on the microfauna. So for me, seeing amphipods running around, seeing mice and shrimp, um, seeing all those little copepods doing their thing is really a sign of a nice, healthy foundation of microfauna in a tank. Now, every tank doesn't necessarily need that microfauna. It's really going to be important if you have coral or those kind of planktivorous fish. That's where it's really going to be meaningful. Uh, but also, too, a lot of those animals are small, and they're very readily impacted by changes in your tank. So if all of a sudden you're, you add something new or you see a die-off in these micro crustaceans, there's a really good chance that something in there is maybe impacting. Um, there, there's changes happening you want to be aware of, or there's something in there that is detrimental to invertebrates that you maybe want to catch before it builds up to a level where it's going to start impacting bigger things. So being aware of kind of those smaller critters as canaries in that coal mine. Yeah. I love that phrase. And then... <laughs> being able to make changes quickly to course correct because you can get heavy metals in your tank from equipment corroding things like that i think a lot of times everybody assumes that just because something is used in to to make aquatic equipment it means that it's 100 percent the entirety of it is safe for aquatic animals but not all aquatic animals and if something corrodes that shouldn't corrode or something cracked that shouldn't get cracked there's a really chance for heavy metals to start leaching into your system. And a, a lot of yeah. the animals are really sensitive to heavy metals. And yeah. It's also a really interesting point about how things that change in your tank are going to affect small things first. And so if you're really, really in tune with the daily ebbs and flows and all of the tiny little creatures in your tank, you notice something that could be really bad earlier because you're saying, oh, I don't have pods. Uh, where, where do they go? Or all my little micro brill stars are gone. Like, Yep. If you notice them before they get to the point where it's obvious and it's affecting your larger livestock, then you can kind of stand it like that. I miss my refugium for that. I don't have a refugium right now. And I, one of my favorite things to do is just to pop the pop the hood on the sump and just, you know, my big head observe <laughs> over the top and just watch like all the a who style. Yeah, yeah. so many like, here, here. bristle worms, <laughs> copepods, amphipods, you know, all the. I, mean, I had a ton of aptasia there. You know, it's just there's a Gross. whole the microcosm of your tank growing down there, and it has inspired me in this moment to set a macro algae tank back up. So we're gonna hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> I had a uh, really cool conversation. We went to we went to John Goff's house yesterday, 
so insane jealous. Insane <laughs> tank. The video will be out. Just wait. Yeah. But it's him and beast. I, him and I were having a conversation and like you know just looking at his tank while Remy did all the work and um, <laughs> <laughs> he was talking to me about it was talking about basically this conversation observation. So he had like a gorgonian and you know sometimes they'll shed just like a leather will and we watched his like uh, purple tang went up and nipped at it. But it did nip at the Gorgonia. It just took some of that kind of like mucus layer off and like the algae went on its way. And he's like, think about how many false correlations people have because they don't observe their tank over a function of time. He's like, I know for a fact that when that Gorgonia is healthy, no fish touches it. But every time this happens, it's a snack. But to the untrained eye, they would go and look and say, ah, my Gorgonian looks sad because my fish is nipping at it. You can't keep tanks with Gorgonians. So that was one thing. Um, another thing we talked about was his NPS tank. So there's a yeah. lot of, you know, it's a very new kind of field. And some people will add, you know, powdered food, and they see dendronephia close up. They're like, ah, it's eating. But in reality, if you look at the literature, like, they really only eat bacteria plankton, like really small micron food. So he was talking about he was testing different foods to feed his NPS and just staring at his tank <laughs> for like hours at a time to see if polyps would close and stay closed to have digestion or if they had opened back up because it was just like yeah. me- mechanical agitation. So I think the biggest oh. thing is looking at your tank as a course of time when observing any of this. Yeah, for I sure. think, Yeah, that's really interesting. The uh, stuff about the Gorgonian makes me think about uh, everyone as a new hobbyist comes across the question of whether Asterinas eat your coral. Oh, yeah. Um, and there's been a lot of debate, and, you know, everyone has their own opinion. Uh, but I think that there's something to be said about if a coral is actively dying, any starfish, any cleanup crew is going to go eat it. Yeah. That doesn't mean they killed it. But noticing that in his tank is really, really interesting because – the fact that those asterinas are gathering around, whether they're eating it or not, is a clue to something bigger. Yeah. yeah. It's that bristle worm thing, too. It's like, they're yeah, maybe exactly. unsightly, but they're great to try divorce, and they're yeah. just, like, down there doing their thing, right? Yeah. yeah I, I have so many in my lagoon. <laughs> I will say, I will so say, there is, there is a, um, a polychaete that kind of looks like a bristle worm. Um, I, th- I think it's Oenida fulgida. They're called clam busters. Oh. It's a yellow polychaete. And they've kind of got these like little tiny dumb heads, but they can make a neurotoxin kind of mucus web that knocks out bivalves and then they can eat them. Wow. Uh, so there are some polychaetes that are not great, but the little pink guys are fabulous. <laughs> the pink guys are fabulous. The pink, the pink yeah. guys are good <laughs> in, in small enough doses. Also, too, if they get unwieldy, that's when you sure. start having some issues. Yeah. That's what killed Nook's clam. He sent me a oh, picture yeah. of that huge clam. We yeah. went and saw this amazing tank in St. Louis. This recently con- happened, too. I yes. can confirm it. And he'd had it for like 10 years, and he was telling me as we were there, he's like, I have these weird polychaetes that create this mucus net. And then, then like two days later, he texts me, he's like, something killed the clam, and I found one of them inside of it. And I was trying to figure out what it was. If you've got that photo, I would love to see, because I That's bet it, you I bet. it's Oneida phlegina. We are so sorry, Nook, but that is the killer. <laughs> also, Oneida phlegina is the name of my next album. So. <laughs> I, think, I might be butchering. Yes. I, this is going, like, I, I looked it up years ago, so I'm pretty, I'm, like, almost positive the species name is phlegina and the genus begins with an O, but I think it's, like, Oneida. Yeah, it doesn't matter at That's this point. That's It's awesome. It's least. named. Yeah. It's done. Yeah. That's Sorry, what are you going to Were you going to say something? Risa? Uh, yeah, I was going to say that um, that is a little scary because even though they all look the same, there are some that really do that. I always had, like, this kind of contract with the bristle worms in my tank. Yes. And that is that if you are polite enough to sneak around, you can exist. But the minute you're out, wandered around during the day. Oh, yeah. You're out. Yeah. Sorry, you didn't make the cut. You will get sucked up in the water change. <laughs> yeah. It's like, just uh, well, part of the thing. these guys are yellow. So they are, they do have the, like, comp- they're the, distinct. the decency to be a different... <laughs> to be like obvious that that's they're good. different. That's good. They're not just like you know, like a firework. Do they only affect the clams? Is that they're no? We've seen them knock out other stuff. Uh, so we've seen them try to take down a tube anemone, uh, and they create this. It's really crazy this mucus web, and then other things start coming in. It's like they create like this little like swarm. It, I mean, objectively, really cool. <laughs> Shad. Sad bivalve died, but really interesting kind of hunting strategy yeah, yeah. for a worm. Uh, to t- and they're they're long, they're long, they're skinny, and they're quick. They are oh. so fast. They just like retract so quickly when you try to get them out. Is that sort of like a cone snail? 
Now, so cone snails are fast in the, like, their harpoon is fast, but I wouldn't say they are necessarily fast. There's one, I, I'm not remembering the name, but there is a snail that kind of reaches out its own flesh and, go, like, goes around the head of a sleeping fish and has the neurotox. Mm. Well, so that in my So cone snails yeah. do that. They have a little harpoon that they shoot out real quick, and then they, like, neurotox in the fish, and then they're like, and now you're sleepy, and I eat you. Mm. <laughs> That's that sounds like a nefarious snail to me. <laughs> nefarious snail. <laughs> okay. Cone snails are cool. There's only a couple that are like genuinely going to kill a person, but there's a lot of cooler ones that are much less toxic. Usually if a cone snail is hunting fish, no touchy. Um, if they hunt other things, less intense toxin. Because if you got to knock out something quick, that toxin's going to work. Quick. Yeah. It's very cool. Uh, back to John's tank real quick, because oh, there's yeah. one other thing that he did mention, and that was the uh, the school of Antheus that he has. Yeah. So he has, I think he has seven, one male, six females. Yeah. He says he knows his tank so well that he knows every night just before the lights go out, a couple hours before the lights go out, all the females will gather on one spot, and they'll swim in the current, and the male will flash down and <gasps> do this like i don't know if it's a mating ritual or you missed it it happened while you're recording <sighs> you did it really it was really cool where happened, were you like, with the camera i was watching it off uh, <laughs> it, fit so, out, but it was cool and th- but this is one of the advantages with him having a 1200 gallon system yeah. is that these fish can actually be themselves for the most part and you can actually see a lot of that natural behavior which is really cool but uh yeah i wonder if there's any validity to the idea that they are maybe trying to spawn maybe i mean a lot of fish, when they want to spawn, they, they want to go to a high flow area. And it would make sense that the females would gather together and the male would like. Pelagic take spawning? That. Yeah. Yeah. I think he saw them release sperm and eggs a couple times as it happened. Yeah. So it was like confirmed, like they were spawning. Are Antheas pela- pelagic spawners? I think because there's there's a lot of fish that do the the whole dance right um, and in the middle. They don't actually lay eggs on a surface. What kind of Antheas were they? Liar tail, I think. I want to yeah. see yes. yeah, yeah, that would make sense. I thought we were still talking about and their eggs like can float to the top. And, yeah, yeah. A lot of um, a lot of zoos and aquariums will collect those eggs and then send them to if they don't have capacity to rear them, they'll send them to Rising Tides, which is a mm. conservation organization so. who rears basically. You send them hodgepodge eggs, they rear <laughs> hodgepodge <laughs> eggs, and they go here are fish for aquariums. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. That is cool. Wow. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Do you guys want to talk about anything else? I think this is a good place to wrap up unless you uh what y'all got? Unless you got something. No, I think this is cool. I think there's a lot of homework on our end yeah. to try and help start building out some of these resources. Yeah. Uh well, but there's also homework on the hobbyist end. Go stare at your tank. Go stare at your yeah. tank. Know what's going on. Know every single thought in every th- single snail's head. Yeah. Read out. <laughs> Please do not add dyes to your tank yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Testing has yet to be this cleaner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure he does not. I think, like he Risa said, adding dyes to your tank. I think <laughs> taking taking twenty minutes, thirty minutes out of your day someday, and just not going down and not touching anything. Nope. Don't touch anything. Don't touch any lights. Don't scrape any glass. Just go down there, or wherever your tank is. My tank's in the basement, so I say down there. Uh, just watch. Just. Yeah. Look at a certain sections of the tank, and I think you'll you'll probably learn a lot about all the fish and coral and inverts in your tank. So yeah. uh, I'd like to say thank you to everybody for joining in the Reef Builders studio, uh, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Kick up your feet and enjoy a little reef therapy on your own. <laughs> That's not how we end this. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> But we will turn it out. <laughs> and we're out. Awesome. Yeah. Let's try to tie it back with observing your tank and having your own therapy.